time and talking about acid rain, some things related to acid rain. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on antacids, like a slide or so, and then we'll talk a little bit about some acids and bases around your house <coughs> and in health in general. But primarily we'll be looking at the acid rain aspects. Acid rain are actually three primary reactions that lead to the acidity of rainwater, and they, they all occur to some extent naturally. Uh, carbon dioxide, can react with water to form carbonic acid, H2CO3. This is what you see in Coke, soda pop, things like that. Uh, sulfur trioxide can react with water to form sulfuric acid, which tends to be uh, make for acidic rainwater. And then uh, nitrogen dioxide can react with water to form nitric acid, and NO. And so uh, notice the sources of these carbon dioxide, of course, comes from respiration of everything. It gives carbon dioxide up. SO3 comes from react oxygen reacting with SO2. We'll see where the SO2 comes from in just a minute. And NO2 comes from the reaction of nitrogen and oxygen, both components in the air, just from processes such as lightning strikes. <coughs> it's a pretty natural process. It's not something you're going to stop. So if these are all sort of natural types of processes, where do the man-made contributions to acid rain come into play? Look in this uh, table over here. What we've done is I've got a table set up where we talk about those different compounds, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide. And look at what the parts, what the concentration is in parts per million. Now parts per million is just like a percent. A percent is really a parts per hundred, where you multiply by a hundred. A parts per million is where you take the fraction and multiply it by a million. And all it does is give us the number that's more convenient to look at. If we didn't use it here, then my 0.05 parts per million would be 0.05 parts per million or something, parts per percent. So, so we, this is more convenient to use. So if we look at carbon dioxide, the natural concentration of carbon dioxide in the environment is about 0.05 parts per million. Okay, about 0.05 parts per million. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from respiration of animals, comes from decomposition of any kind of organic matter. It's kind of a common product uh, of just about any process that we have going on. So, if there's that much in the environment, where does man come into play? Well, let's take a look at what man does here. Here's man. The concentration in an urban environment of carbon dioxide is somewhere in the order <coughs> of 1 to 50 parts per million. Okay, now, even the low end, at the 1 parts per million, that's 20 times greater than what the natural concentration is. Okay, so, so there's quite a bit that comes from this man-made man-made processes, and in particular things like industrial processes, any kind of combustion, any kind of fuel combustion, uh, is going to bring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So your car going down the road, carbon dioxide is one of your products of combustion. Uh, a coal-fired power plant, carbon dioxide is one of the products of combustion. And so there's lots of sources where we can make, where we as, as people produce carbon dioxide, which gets into the atmosphere and causes some, a great increase in the concentration of that. If we look at the sulfur dioxide, now the sulfur dioxide uh, comes naturally from things like volcanoes, uh, forest fires will have some of that in, and bacterial types of actions. Forest fires will also have carbon dioxide as one of the byproducts in there. And so, uh, I don't know if you read in volcanic, volcano ex volcanic explosions sometimes, those plumes carry just incredible amounts of stuff for long ways around the world when that happens. So what about in the urban environment? What's the concentration there? Well, the concentration in the urban environment is 0.1 to 2 parts per million. So 0.1 is about 100 times bigger than the high end of the sulfur dioxide at 0.01 parts per million, or 10 times, sorry, 10 times bigger than, than the 0.01. And so, so where does that come from? Well, again, this comes from industrial processes, uh, fuel combustion, because very often in cases like um, yeah, we'll have sulfur-containing fuels, sulfur-containing coal, things of that nature. The sulfur dioxide will be one of the primary products from those. What about the nitric oxide? Oops, let me see if I can go up. I can. Uh, nitric oxide, 0.01 parts per million naturally. Not very high concentration. Where does it come from? As mentioned earlier, lightning. Come from lightning. Come from the combustion of organic matter. When I burn organic matter, nitrogen dioxide or nitric oxide can be one of my products of that reaction. What's it look like in an urban environment? It's about 0.2 parts per million. So about 20 times the concentration that is there naturally. And where does it come from? One of the primary sources is any kind of combustion process. Well, uh, internal combustion engines in particular, because an internal combustion engine you take and you force the air into the chamber, 
ignite the whole thing off. Sure, your fuel reacts with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water and all these kind of products, but you also have 80% nitrogen in there. That reacts as well <coughs> at those high temperatures to make, um, to make nitrogen dioxide. So if we think about acid rain for a minute, natural rainwater doesn't have a pH of 7. That would be neutral. It actually has one a little bit acidic, about 5.6. Mostly because of the naturally occurring reactions we saw a couple of slides ago. The carbon dioxide, the sulfur dioxide, the nitrogen dioxide. The human activities on the planet nearly quadruple the concentration of sulfur dioxide in the air. And so in a, lar in a large part due to sulfur containing coal and fossil fuels. And so we put a lot of SO2 up by the processes that we do. Turns out that with that extra acid up in the air, the pH of rain can now be as low as about 4, okay, and even lower in some cases. So you might think, well, wait a minute, 5.6 is normal, 4 is not so bad. But you go back to the previous unit, think about the pH scale, that's like a factor of 10 to 20 times uh, more hydrogen ion than what normal rain has. Remember, it goes by factors of 10. And so it's like 100, around the order of 100 times more concentrated in hydronium ion if you don't pay attention to those decimal places. And so, so what we find happening in the acid rain is the stuff we put up comes up, makes the rain more acidic, and then freshwater lakes uh, with living organi organisms without being affected by man-made pollution would have a pH between about 6.5 and 8.5, and somewhere in there. Um, but it turns out that the pH of the fresh water doesn't really match that for several reasons. One is that uh, they're in contact with all sorts of things that can dissolve in it and change the pH as well. And so, so we can actually end up with a pH in a lake that's somewhere down below, down in the order of 4 or something like that, from all the stuff that we've put into it in that process, and that can be a severe problem for wildlife, for aquatic life. Just a schematic, uh, NOx is something you might have seen called NOx, we call them NOx compounds. That's all the different nitrogen compounds. You go way back in the course and think back to uh, naming nonmetal oxides. We looked at nitrogen as an example of like four or five different nitrogen oxides, N2O, NO, NO2, N2O4, N2O5. Just lump them together and call them NOx. In that schematic that you see, <coughs> what you'll notice about it is down on the ground, there's a power plant and there's a car. And the, power, and the car is kicking out NOx compounds from its tailpipe. The power plant is kicking out NOx compounds. And the power plant is also kicking out sulfur dioxide because it's t using sulfur-containing coal. And so it burns, goes up in the air, gets up in the clouds. The clouds are really just big vapor clouds. They're water, basically. And so this stuff dissolves inside of there, forms sulfuric acid, nitric acid. And then it can come down either in the form of rain, snow, sleet, and get on the ground and get into lake beds and everywhere else, or it can actually come down as dry deposition of gases and things uh, on the ground. And so it's a big cycle where we put it up in the air and it comes back down in a more acidic form. A couple of slides here, just kind of interesting data if you ever want to look at it. See, this is obviously a map of the United States, uh, distorted it looks like. The red is where the pH of the um, rain is acidic, down in the 4.1, 4.3 area. Notice over in the northeast part of the country, that's where you see the big reds. That's because in the northeast part of the country, the coal, a lot of the coal ha contains a fair amount of sulfur with it. So when you're burning coal from there, you're burning, uh, you're creating sulfur dioxides and making making the rain more acidic over in the west part of the country, you don't see anywhere near that level of acidity. As a matter of fact, pH is 5.3, 5.5, fairly normal. The difference between these would actually be even greater, uh, except that in the west, the coal doesn't have as great an energy content, so you have to, bowl, you have to burn more of it <coughs> to get the same amount of energy out. And so, uh, so it kind of helps it catch up a little bit to the northeast, but not a whole lot. If you want to look at the freshwater pHs in the U.S., the kind of orangey color around here is where we're looking at acid types of freshwater pHs, down in 4.3, 4.3 to 4, 5, somewhere in there. Again, it's kind of up in the northeast part of the country. That's not surprising if that's where most of the acid rain is going to come from. That's where you might expect this to happen.
And so it turns out she can actually, chemistry can help with some of this because we can help improve some of the emission problems that we have. Uh, some of the things we can do is take and uh, put scrubbers and things on power plants to take some of the sulfur compounds out, uh, change the coal feed we use instead of using a high sulfur coal, figure out ways of using other coal to make it work out better. Of course, all of these things cost money. That's where the topics come into play in the, in the political and the national and the worldwide spectrum is everything you do to do this costs money, so you have to decide what the balance is between what you're going to do. Uh, if you want to look at the effect of over a period of time, how the pHs have changed in different areas, you can go to that link that I have there. It's kind of fun to play with. It has concentration animation, so you can watch how over this year it was like this, this year it was like that, and you can see, you know, watch your favorite part of the country and see what it looks like. This one, I always like this pictures, these pair of pictures. The one on the left, <coughs> excuse me, is taken uh, at the from of a statue over the entrance to a castle in Germany. Okay, now, the castle was built in 1702. That picture on the left-hand side obviously wasn't taken in 1702 because they didn't take pictures like that then, but that picture was taken in 1908. So that picture on the left was taken after the castle had been up for about 206 years. And if you look at the picture, you see the full features of the woman in the statue. You see the edges on the clothing. You see all those things. The one on the right was taken 60 years later. The same statue. The explanation for that is because of the high level of acid rain in Germany, that's actually a, like a limestone. The acid will take and dissolve that over time. And basically that statue is being dissolved away by the acidity of the rain. So for 200 years it was fine. And then in 60 years it's nearly destroyed the whole statue. And so it is an important effect. It is one that you can see. Other visible effects very often forests. You know, talk about forests, look at the trees in this forest. Are, uh, the acid rain is killing trees fundamentally. And so it's not a healthy thing any, in any place in the environment. And now to shift off of acid rain and talk about some acids, some good acid use, some base use I guess, we talk about antacids. Antacid sounds like that's something that's against acids, and if you go back to previous units, what's against acids? Bases. Okay, so you think about your stomach. The, stom the pH in your stomach, believe it or not, is a pH of 1. That's a pretty low pH. That's pretty acidic in nature. But it turns out that with stress, with eating strange stuff, with all sorts of things, you can actually get the acid in your stomach built up too high. You get acid indigestion, or whatever you want to call it. And so the way you handle that is if you have an acid that's too acidic, you want to get rid of it, what you've got to do is you've got to neutralize it. You've got to put in some base to neutralize it. And that's all an antacid is. It's just a fancy base, fancy name for a base. Some of the common antacids are listed below are ingredients, sodium bicarbonate, calcium carbonate, aluminum hydroxide, magnesium carbonate, magnesium hydroxide, all sorts of antacids. Uh, I keep churning them out all the time. Um, you already know the hydroxides are bases, aluminum hydroxide, magnesium <coughs> hydroxide. Carbonates are a base as well, and bicarbonate, by the way, is HCO3. It's that polyatomic ion. Uh, but ba basically, they're a base because they can pick up a hydrogen ion. That's all a base has to be able to do is pick up a hydrogen ion. So I could stick a hydrogen on HCO3 and make H2CO3, or I could stick a hydrogen on carbonate and make HCO3 out of that. And so those are also bases. So any one of those uh, could be used as an antacid. And you have to watch what you use sometimes because, for example, sodium is one of those ions when you talk about blood pressure and table salt and things like that. Sodium is one of those ions they talk about. You don't want to get the sodium ion concentration too high because then your blood pressure starts to rise. So you kind of have to watch all of those effects. Some other acids, acid base uses things you might know about sulfuric acid. You've you may have run across that before. That's actually present in car batteries. Uh, some drain cleaners will have it in there. Pretty nasty stuff to have to work with. If you ever handle a car battery, wear gloves and stuff because it's, it's pretty pretty ugly. Hydrochloric acid, let's go back to sulfuric for a minute. If, if you take a, uh, take a glass, don't do this by the way. If you take a glass and you put sugar in it, and then you put sulfuric acid in that glass, what will happen is the sulfuric acid will actually take all of the water pairings out of the sugar. Well, sugar is fundamentally carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It'll extract all the, sh all the water out of there and it'll turn it into like a, just carbon will be the only thing left. It's like a black f uh, Fourth of July snake is what it looks like. It smells really bad in a little bit.
We can do that too if we if we were here, but we aren't. Um, other acids, hydrochloric acid, you may have heard of as muriatic acid, used around swimming pools, cleaning agents, things of that nature. Acetic acid, vinegar is about 5% acetic acid, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, another a base that you might run into is ammonia, ammonia window, window cleaner. Okay. Ammonia is a base in water, and so when you look at ammonia window cleaner, you're actually using a base in that case. And acids and bases are also big parts of biological processes, and so uh, real strong acids and bases can denature proteins, just destroying them. They can't carry out their function anymore. And as I pointed out in an earlier slide, we talked about buffers, the pH of the blood has to be very, very carefully controlled. Um, otherwise, you have severe health issues related to that. So lots and lots of places in your body and your health that acids and bases come into play. This is the end of Unit 27. You should look over the self-assessment exercises at the end of these sections. Uh, also, <coughs> look at the self-assessment in Blackboard. And be prepared for this on quiz, I don't know, five, one of those coming up, and the final exam.